Hi, I'm Adam in Wales and this is my board gaming vlog. And every so often I come across a new area of board gaming, something that I haven't really explored. So several years ago I, I, I experienced 18xx games for the first time, massive economic train games, and I found that they really weren't for me. Um, several years later I happened across uh, three-dimensional puzzle games and I found that was far more up my street. Now I don't know anything about the Puzzle Museum, it's a website that I came across in an internet search engine, but I think their definition of puzzle sounds just about right. So a puzzle is a problem having one or more specific objectives contrived for the principal purpose of exercising one's ingenuity and or patience. Sounds about right, but strictly speaking, these games aren't board games. Though I would say that they are board game adjacent, and that's orthogonally adjacent, not diagonal, ofs. They're often for solo players only, although not exclusively, and they tend to come from mass market companies like Think Fun, uh, the Happy Puzzle Company and Smart Games. Although with the incredible popularity of escape room games, then hobby companies are starting to see that there is some market potential with this stuff. And we see some great examples coming from companies like Pegasus Spiel and Blue Orange. And despite not strictly being board games, I found that these puzzle games frequently give me a similar experience. Often they're very tactile and beautiful, and, and I found that frequently they're most fun when played with a group, even if they're solo puzzles. The win condition is accurately completing the challenge that's offered by those puzzle cards, and I'm definitely utilising the same areas of my brain that I would be if I was min-maxing some resource conversion in a crunchy Euro game. In this video, I'm going to talk about my 10 favourite genres of puzzle games. And if you're a fan of Chronicles of Crime, or Scotland Yard, or maybe Mr Jack, then you might enjoy a logical deduction puzzle. In Dog Crimes from Think Fun, you're dog sitting for six dogs who are messing up your furniture, pooing on your floor, or tearing up your slippers. In each of the 40 included puzzles, you're given a series of clues and a problem to solve, always relating to the positioning of the dogs around the rug illustrated on the central board. So for example, Daisy was sitting in front of a tennis ball and a paw. A dog with perky ears was sitting across from Daisy and Peppa was sitting next to Daisy and so on. So these sort of logical deduction games are probably the puzzles that I personally find the most engaging. I think it's mainly because they've got just a little hint of narrative, a tiny bit of story to just get me into the scene. I enjoy playing at being a detective. There's been a murder in Green Rock Village Theatre. And this puzzle game runs along similar lines to dog crimes. But here we're trying to fill out a five by five grid with locations in one row, actors in another, and time of day, weapons and hotel staff in the remaining rows. Jumbo has produced this lovely portable case which holds everything together neatly, and each of the 50 puzzle cards poses a question about a murder and then a series of clues describing who was in which location at which time. Of course, narrative isn't everything. I really like uh, tactile games, aesthetically beautiful games, and that's where Chroma Cube does well. Here we have a grid in which we place coloured blocks. And as we work our way through the clues, we progressively learn a language. If the card says that Cobalt knows white, it means they're next to each other. And if they've heard of each other, then we know that they're one space apart. If they hate each other, then you'd better get some distance between them. It's a beautiful package with clever twists on the genre. And the 25 included puzzles are really fun, but I'd like to see a little more content in the box. In my own design, Zooligans, I recognised that all of these games have loads and loads of text. And I didn't want that. I wanted to wade deeper into the narrative, but without all that text, I wanted to use images. After closing time, the zoo animals escape from their enclosures and get up to all sorts of mischief. And your job is to interpret the picture clues and determine which animal was engaged in which activity at which location at a given time. As the 60 puzzles get increasingly complex, then more animals are introduced along with more locations and activities. And additional features like the weather get involved. And interpreting the pictures becomes more important. The monkey is soaking wet, why is that? Determining what constitutes a game is a constant headache for the administrators at Board Game Geek, the biggest online database of board games, card games and party games. And sometimes these puzzle games sneak onto the site, but at other times they seem to be ignored. They sit somewhere awkwardly in the middle ground. They are identifiable as a three-dimensional tabletop game in a box, but they have in their roots um, those pen and paper 
puzzles that you'll find in a daily newspaper. And rather arbitrarily, the website declines to include any solitaire game with predetermined solutions, except when it doesn't. And there have been many attempts to gamify this puzzle experience, and we're going to be touching on some of those games in this overview as well. A 2020 series of competitive games from Haba and from the designer of The Crew added a race element to the logical deduction genre. In The Key, players pick up clues from a large pile in the centre of the table. There are no turns, you just grab cards freely. But you don't want to take too many clues, especially the high numbered ones, because these count as points and the lowest scorer is going to win the game. Each player marks off the information they've discovered with dry white markers on their own player screen until the criminal, stolen object and manner of escape is fully determined. The game is very replayable because each game the clues are going to come out in different combinations. Witness is a cooperative deduction game for exactly four players, no more, no less. Each player has their own book which provides some information about a crime and the players whisper their information to another player who has to combine that information with what they already know and then they whisper all the information to another player and so on until all of the information has been shared. Of course, details get forgotten or misunderstood along the way, which can be really funny, and this is where the game really starts to shine. At the end of each round, a book of questions is consulted, and players are tasked with solving details of the crime, and there are 64 different cases to solve. Now, matching games are really a subgenre of logical deduction. Here, players are attempting to position components in, in the same locations as shown on a clue card, and this could be done as a solo exercise, but sometimes it's done as a race against other players. In Mindo, from Pegasus Spieler, players have to position coloured dominoes with cute animals on them into a 3x3 or later a 4x4 grid. The dominoes are reversible, with different images on each side, and the clue cards give you less information to work with as the difficulty ramps up over the 60 included puzzles. There are several different versions of the game with different animals, and the magnetised box is really cute. Now, the worst thing about this game is the title, Mindo. I mean, what is that? It sounds like a, a He-Man character. Face to Face, which also sounds like a villain from He-Man, is from Happy Puzzle Company. And this is a puzzle that I find particularly challenging. In this game, each player has six different cubes with different coloured faces on them. Each cube is different and players must match the layout on one of the 60 clue cards included. But in each row or column, either all the colours must match or all the faces must match. You can play this one solo or as a race against a friend. Fold It is best played as a race. Each player has a fabric sheet with a bunch of different food items on it. And a card is revealed with a particular selection of dishes and each player must fold their sheet until it only shows the required dishes. The first player to achieve it scores points and after multiple rounds, the highest scorer is the winner. There are 42 cards in the game, but they're not separated into progressive difficulty levels. So the solo player might find this game a little bit frustrating. Now, one way to increase the number of puzzles in a box, and I mean massively increase it, is to make it modular. Instead of having a puzzle that's made up from, from clues on a single card, why not bring together multiple cards? This is what Rob Fisher and I did with our matching game, Quuzzle. Quuzzle features 77 double-sided cards, and in each round of the game, you use six of them. And this generates literally billions of possible puzzles. In Quuzzle, players race to position cubes into a 3 by 3 grid. Each cube is identical and can be rotated as you wish. You're trying to match as many of the patterns on the cards as you can before the other player. And the advanced cards add additional complications, such as a requirement to have a certain number of cubes showing a specified colour, or having more cubes showing one colour than another. After one minute, players score points for each card that they match on their grid, and after several rounds, the highest scorer wins. Cosmos released a number of modular puzzles a few years ago. The most well-known was Dimension, which has players racing to stack coloured balls while trying to match the requirements of the cards selected for the round. You might have to play certain colours touching each other, or perhaps one colour must not touch another colour. It's a lovely tactile game with a small dexterity element to it. Which brings me on to our next category, dexterity puzzles. And we've already seen how dexterity can feature as a minor part in a puzzle game like Fold It, but sometimes dexterity is the only mechanism. In Addictable, the players attempt to roll a ball bearing around a three-dimensional maze without falling off the track. And the maze is made up of small numbered sections with progressive difficulty, jumps, loops and drops, which are increasingly challenging to navigate. 
The player can chart their progress by noting the number of the maze section that they've reached and try and get further on their next attempt. It's incredibly difficult, and as the name suggests, it is pretty addictive. Another logic game with a substantial dexterity element is Dr Eureka from Blue Orange. Here players are attempting to tip coloured balls into test tubes in order to match the pattern shown on a challenge card. The fastest player wins the card, and at the end of the game the player with the most cards wins. In Go Go Gelato we're doing the same thing, but we're attempting here to stack balls of ice cream into cones. We're only allowed to touch the balls with the cones as we attempt to match the pattern indicated on the clue card. Once again, we're racing against the other players in order to gain the cards, which count as points at the end of the game. Dr Eureka and Go Go Gelato are both examples of sequential movement puzzles. We need to move one component out of the way in order that we can move the correct component into its, you know, its, its correct position. And we've only got so much space in which to do it. So a classic example of a sequential movement puzzle would be those sliding puzzles that you probably remember from your childhood. So in smart games, Asteroid Escape, players are attempting to get the spaceship off the game board by sliding the other pieces out of its way. But as is generally the case with smart games range, the puzzle is brilliantly engineered with gorgeous tactile playing pieces. And in this game, the planets are of different sizes and they overlap and block each other when you're pushing them into certain combinations. There are 60 different challenges included of increasing difficulty. The classic game Rubik's Race turns a sliding puzzle into a two-player experience. It's a modular puzzle. You generate a unique combination of colours by shaking a little device to establish the challenge at the start of each round. And then players race to slide their tiles around, creating a 3 by 3 grid at the centre of their board to try and match the one shown in the device. And the first player to complete the challenge drops the plastic frame over their own side of the board and takes the victory. The sequential movement puzzles aren't all sliding puzzles. They can involve any restrictions on movement. For example, in the competitive game Ricochet Robots, players are tasked with moving a robot to a specified location in the fewest moves possible. But the robot will always move in a straight line as far as it can, and it'll only change direction when it hits an obstacle. When a player has a solution in mind, they turn over the sand timer, and the other players have one minute to come up with a better solution. In Jump In, the player has to get all of the rabbits into holes. The rabbits can only move by jumping over obstacles. The toadstools can't be moved. And in later puzzles, foxes are introduced, which can be slid around on the grid. The board is cleverly designed so that the movement of the foxes is restricted. And even in such a childish looking game, the puzzles are very, very hard when you reach the expert or master or the wizard level. The game packages up neatly with a transparent plastic lid. If you're familiar with my YouTube channel, then you'll know that many of my favourite board games involve tile laying. And when we're talking about tiling puzzles, we're generally closer to Baron Park than we are to Carcassonne. Generally, tiling puzzles involve fitting all of the components within a confined space, usually a grid. IQ Puzzler Pro from Smart Games features three modes of play. Two of these modes involve placing Tetra-style pieces into a grid, but the game comes with two different shaped grids for a variable challenge. One of the grids has deeper holes in the 5x5 sections at the centre, and this section is used for a three-dimensional matching puzzle, which tasks players with building a pyramid using those Tetris pieces. The genius part of the Happy Puzzle Company's genius range is that they're all modular puzzles, but they're always solvable. And the easiest game in this range is Be Genius, which is for quite young children. And then we've got the Genius Star, which is for expert players, and the original family level game, the Genius Square. In the Genius Square, dice are rolled to indicate where to place blocking pieces onto the board. This establishes the unique playing field that players are going to be working with. And then two players race to position all of their polyominoes onto the grid. The first to complete the grid wins the game. It's hard to believe that there's always a solution, but I'm reliably informed that that is indeed the case. If you're more inclined towards Carcassonne than patchwork, then a connection puzzle might be your thing. Rainer Knizia has a range of puzzles published by Pegasus Spieler called Brains. Several of these are tile-laying connection puzzles. In Treasure Map, you have a map card with a grid for up to one to six tiles, and each card is a separate challenge. There are 50 of them in the game. The edges of the grid indicate what type of path must connect into that position. For example, a path must cross through a lake, or maybe through a treasure chest, or it might need to cover a certain number of tiles, or to connect matching symbols. 
You must find the most useful tiles from the eight tiles provided and position them so that the paths fulfill the requirements of the map card. Smart Games Temple Connection takes this into the third dimension with large plastic roads and bridges of varying heights which must connect the temples together in order to solve the 80 included challenges. The large golden dragon acts as a blocking piece to make your life more difficult. And not all puzzle games test your intellect. Some of them test your eyes. And everyone's familiar with those spot the difference puzzles that you'd find in comics and puzzle books in your youth. And like most puzzle types, this has been gamified, this time by publisher Gigamic. Difference and Difference Junior both feature decks of cards with beautiful detailed images on them. There are four different sets of matching images in each tin, and one card is placed into the centre of the table, and each player is given a card with the same basic image. Every card will feature exactly two differences to any other card from the same set. The players race to be the first to spot the two differences between their card and the card at the centre of the table. Difference isn't dissimilar to Dobble, the brilliant speed game where players race to identify the one item which links their card to the card at the centre of the table. As with Difference, some maths boffin somewhere has worked out a system whereby every card will always have exactly one matching item with any other given card. Braintopia is a collection of speed puzzles, mostly based around observation, or elements of that. It's another ridiculous title, I don't know, perhaps Braintopia is the home planet of the evil sorcerer Mindo. But fortunately, in the UK, the game is known as Cortex Challenge, a much more sensible name. But the gameplay is much the same. Here we have mazes, where you might have to identify the correct exit before the other players, or puzzles where you have to spot which item is repeated on the card, or memory games where you have to recall all the items that have been seen on the card, and puzzles using the Stroop effect, which word is written in its own colour, along with several other puzzle types. If you enjoy the challenge of a Where's Wally book, then you'll love the game Macro Micro Crime City. In Macro Micro, players look at a large illustrated sheet showing a city scene and many characters and scenarios within. The drawings are detailed and each character is represented many times at different stages of their story. The players select a case and take the appropriate cards, each of which asks a question. Together, the players look at the city sheet and they try and find the relevant scenes and characters to answer those questions posed on the cards. The game has 16 different cases of increasing complexity. For some puzzlers, Sudoku is where it's at. And of course, puzzle games, they've got you covered. In deduction, you position magnetic ducks on a 4 by 3 grid, and they must appear in a chain of consecutive numbers. So one must be next to two, which must be next to three, etc. There are three different colours of duck, and the puzzle card will indicate either a colour that must be in a certain position, or a number, or sometimes both and you need to deduce where the remaining ducks fit within the grid. And finally, we've got word puzzles. And I've got lots of games in my collection that are based around crisscrossing letters to form interconnecting words. Scrabble and Upwords are probably the classic examples. But perhaps the most freeform version of this game is Bananagrams. In Bananagrams, each player starts with a selection of face-up tiles, and a pile of face-down tiles are available to all players at the centre of the table and players race to connect their letter tiles, forming an intersecting grid of words. You can rearrange your grid at any time, and whenever a player has used up all of their tiles, they call out Peel, and every player takes one extra tile. Players can also call out Dump, and place one of their tiles into the central pool, but then they must take three more tiles in return. When the central pool is reduced to fewer tiles than the number of players, then the first player to use up all of their letter tiles, and hence complete their word grid, wins the game. So there we have it, 10 categories of puzzle games. And of course, there are many games out there that combine a variety of different puzzle types within the same package. Most notably, the escape room games like Exit or Unlock. I've only played a few Exit games and I've had mixed experiences with them. And because they're games that you destroy as you play them, I haven't got anything to show you in this particular video. But they're certainly a really good sociable way of getting a group of puzzlers together and working cooperatively through the experience. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please watch some of the others on my channel, Adam's Board Game Wales, on Board Game Geek, I'm Adam78, or you can follow me on Twitter, at Board Game Wales. There's loads of content on this YouTube channel about board game designs, board game reviews, top tens, there's even a top 100. So I hope to see you here again. Anyway, for now, all the best.